The theory of evolution dominates Western thought. There are some people who consider evolution to be axiomatic, something that any sane person agrees with, believes in it, but it be, has become an article of faith for many. Anyone who, does, uh, who uh, in their eyes, anyone who does not believe in evolution is backward, is lacking, is uh, simply closing himself off to reality. So this is not the case. The beauty of evolution was that it fulfilled a need. It uh, gave us uh, an organization, a way to organize uh, information to explain reality, that everything fit into it, that uh, reality could be predicted, predicated uh, on this explanation, even though there were a lot of problems with it, that, that they covered over, that they didn't admit to, or that they uh, ignored. Even so, it worked. It worked for them. It was a model. It was a model. It was a working theorem. So now we have a, a different explanation. An explanation that's been proven at least to a greater than degree than evolution has, it has been proven in the laboratories. It has been observed to take place under, under scientific requirements. It also explains reality and explains it better than evolution did. That's, that makes sense. And that can be replicated, whether, whereas evolution could not. So we'll explain a little bit what we're talking about and get right into the subject. We, we give an example. We have fish. Fish. Herring. Herring is a fish. Herring is obtained in the North Atlantic, North Pacific. It is a tasty fish, juice like herring, often on bar mitzvahs, on uh, celebrations, or on uh, important uh, days. Is cust but not too, but not too important. Uh, important days that are of a moderate, of a moderate level. It is customary to have a, a little glass of schnapps and a crack with a piece of herring on it, and and that's the way it goes. Herring is is, is healthy. Herring is tasty. Herring is a valuable fish. Herring helped build the uh, country of Norway. It was also important to other nations in the North Atlantic. And over the time, the spawning grounds or the migratory paths of herring changed from one area to another. Uh, like a herring, like other fish, it moves around. Seasonally, the herring migrate between uh, wintering, a place where they stay in the winter and don't move, hardly move, spawning another place where they spawn, where they lay their eggs, another place where they feed, feed and build themselves up. And they move around from one area to another and transverse great distances. And it happens that over a period of time they sometimes have to move. That they decide, all of them decide or understand that they all have to move in the future. That the old places that they've been going to for tens of years, hundreds of years, I don't know for how long, forever and ever, now they can't go there anymore, they have to go somewhere else. And we're not certain why they move, but so there are different explanations. Some say that the relative salinity of the ocean, sometimes the, the, the degree of, of salt in the water changes. Sometimes the temperatures of the water changes. Sometimes the current, sometimes the currents, the uh, international currents change. Whatever the case is, herring sometimes change their pathways in the seas as do other, other fish. So at one stage, herring the North Atlantic decided to move a little bit further northward than they had previously done. But the new area that they had the need of going to was colder than the previous one. And also there, the water was icy. There was ice in the water. And as they were then built, they wouldn't have been able to survive in the new environment. So what did they do? What did they do? They acquired an antifreeze gene from another breed of fish. 
In other words, there were already a certain type of fish. It's believed to be a kind of a sea raven, uh, a certain type of fish, that, um, that had an antifreeze gene. And they um, somehow caused this other fish with the antifreeze gene to excrete this gene of his into the water and the herring picked it up and therefore was suited to move to the north. They picked up the antifreeze gene and they were able to move to another climate, to another environment. And not only that, but later on, they passed on this same gene to smelt a kind of sardine who also had need of it. So this is what we have. We have genes moving around. And how do the fish get this gene from each other? It's uh, through a horizontal gene, gene transfer. As we said, the fish with the gene, who already had the gene, received a biological message to excrete the gene into the water. The fish without the gene then picked it up, and it wasn't just one single pioneer doing this, it was all of them all together over a short period of time, affecting this transformation so that the whole breed, the whole millions of fish changed from one type to another in order to adapt themselves to their environmental requirements. And this uh, occurs in the, in the animal kingdom very often. It occurs between different species, sometimes even perhaps between species and plants. But it is a common occurrence. And the implications of this, in effect, in effect, they nullify the need for evolution. Evolutionary theory no longer is required. It is outdated to superfluous, clumsy, unreliable and incorrect. As we shall explain, horizontal gene transference is similar to what happens in our time with with GMOs, with GMOs, what are GMOs? Genetically modified organisms. This is a modern development where, for instance, uh, they play around with the genes. Uh, you might have a, a, a tomato. You have tomatoes. Tomatoes naturally grow and ripen and they look red. Well, most of them look red, some of them don't. Some of them might look a little bit green. But they taste the same as the red ones. But nevertheless, the housewives and the, and the customers don't want to buy the green tomatoes. They want to only buy the red ones. So what do the, G, the MGO people do? They find another plant, such as a, a red berry, which is a very red color. And they isolated the gene that gives this berry this red color. And somehow or other they grabbed it onto the tomato. And hence for the tomato be, uh, can be relied upon to grow all reddish and saleable and attractive to the people who want to buy it. And uh, this is, happens uh, today, this happens all the time. People don't like it, people are afraid of it, they are afraid that this playing around with the genes can somehow have adverse effects on human beings, and it might have. It might do, but nevertheless, you cannot stand up to market pressures. This is what is needed. This is what is done. And uh, genetically modified organisms are quite common. They're used to increase crop, crop yields, to increase the yields of, of, of crops, to reduce the cost for food, for drugs, to reduce the need for pesticides, to grow crops that are more resistant to pests, to enhance the nutrient composition and food quality that the plants might stay fresh longer and uh, give more nutrition to the people eating them to be resistant to pests and disease, greater, greater food security, medical benefits and also uh, crops that mature faster, tolerate aluminium, tolerate uh, all kinds of different uh, 
all kinds of, of different uh, components of the soil, aluminium, boron, salt, drought, forced, and other environmental stresses, anything that normally interferes with crop growing, they now moderate, uh, uh, they now doctor the genes of the plant to make it resistant to uh, whatever is interfering it. And uh, so too, salam, salamon have been uh, modified to grow larger, to be more resistant to disease, and uh, so, so the same with cattle, and uh, the, the list is growing. Uh, and uh, what MGOs do? Are in effect imitating nature because this occurs apparently in nature all the time. Genes move from one organism to another. They move in three known ways. One is transformation, which we saw in the case of the herring. The gene is released into the atmosphere or into the water or whatever. It travels to the needy party. The party that needs it picks it up. Transduction. Is another way through which genes are, uh, are transmitted from one organism to another. A, a, a type of virus uh, gets into a cell, cuts off a portion of the DNA in the cell that it needs, replicates it, and then moves to another organism and takes a replicated section with it. Or conjugation, two cells join together to our Two, two different cells joined together. One of them has a section, something that the other one needs. This is replicated. And then once it is replicated, the, the, the two cells that are joined together, once again, split apart. But now both parties have the, have the, have the same section that was wanted in the first place. And as we say, as we saw, most gene transference uh, appears to take place through gene transfer, transference that is via the atmosphere or the environment. And uh, we, we know the gene transfer takes place in plants, in mitochondrial gen genetics, and it, uh, in the microbial world, it happens all the time. It has been observed under the microscope. It also occurs in fungi and plants and in animals. And it could be that up to 50%, some, some different, uh, different estimations, 50% of the genome in the animal kingdom is comprised of genes that have been transferred. In other words, changes don't have to come about through evolution, through one organism developing a slightly mutational advantage on his fellow. And because he has this advantage, when all the others die out, he remains behind. And then he, and this goes on generation after generation, year after year after year, millions of years back. That's why evolution always, always estimates the time it takes for organisms to change from one to another in millions of years because they cannot conceive of it taking place straight away. And the, the, the longer it is, the more they can get away with it. They have a tall tale. But so, so if you're going to tell someone that it can take place overnight, no one's going to believe them. But if they say it can take place after millions and millions of years, so who knows? Way back in the never, never, it's a fairy tale. That is what evolution is. And uh, with this new understanding of genetic transference, you don't need it. Changes can take place immediately. We find these changes taking place. In our climbs, we have a lot of snow, a lot of ice. A great many of the animals in those areas are suddenly all white. White, bears, rabbits, hares, walrus, seals, deer, tigers, even tigers, owls, foxes, geese, even monkeys. You find monkeys with blonde hair and blue eyes in cold climates. 
and uh, where did they get this from? They got these genes. They changed to that. They, they, they changed these genes. Came to them from others who had the same features, and somehow or other, genes moved from one to another, and that is how all changes, or most changes, take place. And this is not evolution. We're not saying that one a certain type of animal changes into another type of animal. A butterfly is not going to become a butterigar, but a black butterigar that needs to become white because of the changes in its, in its need to camouflage itself in a new environment, could do so, could do so by acquiring a white gene from somewhere else and once this uh, gene is acquired, it can transfer it through hereditary. And that is how all changes seem to take place. This explains a lot, it explains everything. And it happens, it is observed. But the Almighty, when he created animals, when he created the animal kingdom, he placed within the animals within the plants, within his creatures, the ability to adapt, to adapt in the same way as they otherwise adapt. If it's cold, then they develop resistance to cold. If it's hot, then they develop ways to thrive under hot conditions. And they pass these advantages onto their offspring. And it may be that if they move from one area to another, they may or may not be able to affect changes in themselves. But the option exists. The option can exist under certain conditions for whole populations to undergo the required changes. And what is the pertinence for us? For our theories, for our understanding of history, we found through the Bible through the Bible, through the sages, through commentaries on the Bible, through our understanding of the Hebrew language, we found that the Bible predicted that lost and tribes would be amongst Western peoples. We also found through history, legends, and numerous fields of study that lost and tribes had. They had moved from the Middle East and they had gone to Western Europe. And that therefore they were the blood brothers, the next of kin to the Jews. And we have uh, strong proofs about this, but we constantly came up uh, against the barrier of DNA. People would ask us, why uh, is there not a DNA similarity between them? And we didn't really have an answer until now, but now we do have. The DNA changes according to environment, and the changes take place very quickly over a short period of time. The changes take place according to environmental requirements and that is all we need. We don't need to have to prove that it took place, so it did, and uh, more study may tell us when and how. But it is enough for the time being to show that it is scientifically feasible, that it is an acceptable possibility. That combined with the other proofs is enough, or at least it is a step forward. And this, this is important to us. Just point out a few facts that different types of DNA, especially different types of DNA in males. Male DNA, Western Europe is dominated by R1B. R1B is uh, related to R1A, which is also found in Eastern Europe among Slavic peoples and uh, peoples in India and in East Asia. And in the West, we have R1B. R1B, according to the experts, is said to have originated, originated in Turkey. Turkey is not that far away from the land of Israel, especially when you consider the extended borders of, of ancient Israel. You still reach up into that region. And that is where R1B is said to have begun, even though that is not dominant in that region, because there in Turkey we find the greatest number of variants 
and what was appeared to be the the oldest, the, the variants and the most early variations that is usually accepted to, to indicate the place of origination. That is where they say R1B began. And also when they find R1B groups that had R1B in that region, they usually they find neighboring areas, neighboring groups with J. J and R1B are, are, uh, are partners, associates, historically. Even though, uh, even though they're quite different, otherwise and J is considered a major group amongst the Jews about one-third of the Jews have J, J1 or J2 and also the Cohen's who are considered to be one of the uh, strongest elements amongst the Jewish population are up, up, up to 80 percent J1 and J2 and in ancient times, they were associated, they not they, the J1 type was associated with groups that had R1B. So they were neighbours to each other. And if changes were to take place, they would have been in the area uh, for them to do so. As we said, this is all speculation and doesn't really prove anything. But it shows that the possibility existed, that there's more to it, the story than we would think. And that it is enough for us to know that the possibility of change was in place and uh, could be affected. This also explains why we have R1B amongst black people, black people in uh, Central Africa, a large number of peoples in Central Africa, on the west coast of Africa and Central Africa also have that one be. And they are not similar, otherwise they're not uh, racially similar to peoples in the north. They are quite different. Uh, so this, but that there was some type of environmental requirement that this should be a dominant amongst them is also feasible and that they require to this change through horizontal gen trans, uh, transfer is also feasible and so too do the people in the north receive the same gene because uh, they, in that region of the air of the earth for some reason or other possibly because they some connection to the Atlantic Ocean this change needed to take place. At all events, these new findings, these new findings, actually they're quite old, but we didn't know about them. The public doesn't know about them, but they've been around for some time, and the ability for different organisms to take in new genes, new genetic material, from its surroundings, from other animals, even from other species, and thereby to affect changes that are almost overnight, changes that according to the old theory of evolution would have taken a million years to go into place. But now, within uh, almost immediately they can be affected, changes the whole scenario. Therefore, evolution is no longer needed, it is no longer theoretically acceptable, it is superfluous, and it is unjustified. So they'll have to think something else up, they'll have to find some other explanation for their machinations and, and, and vain imaginations, for their machinations and vain imaginations. At all events, evolution is longer, longer acceptable. Also, the difference in uh, in uh, DNA is no longer a barrier to there having been sanguinity between different groups from them originally having come from the same parent, and uh, that is also something that we. That is helpful to us. 
It doesn't take the place of anything, it doesn't come in place of anything, but it adds to it, adds to the rest. It reinforces the rest of what we have. Well, God bless you. Thank you.